so uh, as, as I was starting to say, having, having spent a, a long time focused on American domestic politics and world politics and the buildup to an aftermath of the election, we're, we're, we're taking a break and we're spending some time thinking about some other issues that I think are, are very important um, and important to us as a society, important ethically and in terms of the justice of our society, and then also important in a sense existentially, right? We, we all age and, and uh, we're all living longer. How can we make the most out of our longer lives? And so hence justice, care, ethics, and the lifespan revolution. And um, to, to just very quickly frame the issue again, um, these diagrams I think help, right? We, we're living, you know, at, at this point projected to live maybe five times as long as the average human lifespan for most of human history. Um, and uh, changing the demographic shape, the age distribution of our society, which has been pyramidic for um, almost all of human history, as far as we can tell, that is to say the largest strata in terms of the age is the young people and each strata up there are fewer people so it looks like a pyramid and by the time you get to the 60s 70s 80s it's a very small portion of the population and um the new uh distribution looks more quadrilinear right the, the, that is to say it's a it's a rectangle and uh there may actually be fewer people at the base than there are in the middle. And then a lot of people living into their 60s, 70s, and a substantial portion into their 80s and 90s, right? The, the um, child born today is more likely to live to 100 than not. So uh, 100 years from now, the top may be basically all but equal to the bottom. And, and this is driven by, of course, the lifespan revolution, but also by the birth rate crisis. We're having fewer children, we're living longer. And so the very shape of our society demographically is changing in a dramatic way. But, and this is the jumping off point for the course, it looks like our society, our mindsets and worldviews, and our culture are slow to reckon with this. And, and so the question is, what kinds of reform, what kinds of change do we need to be able to fully and productively incorporate people who are living longer to afford them meaning, dignity, and flourishing later in life? And that's, that's the jumping off point. Um, we have spoken uh, at some length about the pioneering work of Louis Aronson, a uh, public health doctor and geriatrician at the University of California in San Francisco in her book, Elderhood. And then last week we began our discussion of a uh, neuroscientific perspective, just to, to have things in mind. Um, Aronson suggested that we needed to resist the medicalization of aging, treating aging as primarily a process of decline, decay, and disease, and that this needs to start with medicine, but that given the prestige of medicine, the culture shaping power of medicine, particularly on the issue of aging, it needs to broaden out to the culture as a whole. We need a more humanistic and holistic perspective on aging. We need to give individuals who are aging more agency over medical decision making and to recognize that they may have different priorities at that stage in their life than they would have had 20 or 30 or 40 years before and that the medical profession needs to both come to grips with the idea that when people are living longer they may care more about their health span than their lifespan their quality of life than the quantity of life. <clears throat> and so we need to both change the medical perspective and the broader culture uh, by changing the way medicine treats 
those in elderhood and changing the prestige and power we give to medicine. That then takes us into a second perspective, which is a neuroscientific perspective. And to gain that perspective, I'm turning to the works of Daniel Levitin. And, and Levitin, as I mentioned to you last week, is an accomplished neuroscientist who was a tenured professor at the University of McGill and still, I believe, teaches there as an emeritus professor, but is uh, now splitting his time between Montreal and California. He's, he's from Northern California originally, and he's involved with the uh, Minerva Academy in Northern California. Um, he uh, is a musician as well. And I'll, I'll just say something very quickly here, and I'll, I'll return to this later. But I, I, I think that one of the things that's interesting to ask about the authors that we treat in this class is um, why is it that they have come to the critical insights and perspectives that they've reached? I'm getting a, a request to make my voice a bit louder. Um, and uh, I'm using my computer's microphone, so the best way probably for me to make my voice louder is to talk louder. Please give me feedback. And, and, and the other thing you can do is turn up the volume on your computer and, and see if maybe the issue is on your end as well. Uh, but but uh, please do let me know if you're having trouble hearing me. Um, so he, one of the things that I, I think is really important with it, Aronson is that her grandmother was extremely important in her life. One of the psychological studies that I'll look at later in this course looks at people who lived with their grandparents when they were very young and in, in the early years of their life, as opposed to people who lived with their grandparents when they were in their teens and 20s and how that shapes their views of elderhood and, and that the people who are living with their grandparents when they're very young have more positive views of elderhood than do the people who move in later. And that then changes their own interpretation of themselves as they age. Louise Aronson had a, a, an experience like that in terms of the importance of her grandmother early in her life and in, in modeling a kind of active, engaged, intelligent, flourishing elderhood. And, and Levinton has a somewhat different experience, but I think it's, a, it's relevant to emphasize the biography here for a moment, which is that he is a musician and rather than going to college and graduate school straight out of high school, he actually spends a decade uh, working as a musician and a, in uh, and music engineering recording, then goes to graduate school, or I'm sorry, to undergraduate and graduate school when he's 10 years older than everybody else. So he's got a little bit of that experience of, of, of being off age. And it turns out that the people that he studies with in graduate school at the University of McGill are almost all in their 70s and then he ends up teaching there and by the time he's doing collaborative work with them they're in their 80s and 90s and and so again you know biographically there are things that make perhaps some of the authors that we read uh, a little bit less biased against the aging than our culture as a whole tends to be um what neuroscience teaches to, to, to just have some really broad markers here is on the one hand that the brain develops, continues to grow, continues to show neuroplasticity, actually new generation of neurons, new capacity for learning, therefore all the way into the 80s at least, maybe into the 90s as well. And so um, the idea that it's all decline just is inaccurate to the neuroanatomy of the brain. The, the second big idea here is that, well, genetics do matter, but they're only one of 
three main factors that determines how the brain develops and ages. Lifetime experience and environment are also extremely important. We'll talk more about this as we get further into the class, but there's the distinction between genetics and epigenetics. And um, one way that Levitin expresses that distinction is to say, it's like having a script or a play and then having different actors perform those parts, right? The way Lawrence of Olivier as a opposed to a uh, contemporary American actor portrays King Lear, it, right? You, you get very different interpretations or Hamlet if you, if you prefer, right? And, and, and so um, that similarly, people with basically identical genetics may express those genetics in very different ways, depending upon what happens in their lives and in their environments. And, and one of the big factors here is the kind of personality that the individual develops. And the move to draw on psychology, in addition to neuroscience, focuses on the idea that we have variable personality traits, that, that, that there are major dimensions of difference across human beings. There's a big scientific literature trying to figure out exactly how to do these comparisons. Can we say that there are main differentia of traits that are appropriate or applicable to all cultures, or is this stuff culturally specific? As we're about to see, Levitin takes a position on this. But I think that the big thing to notice here is that personality varies. You don't need psychology to tell you that, right? And that the way your personality shapes your experience of life then in part determines or at least strongly influences how your brain develops and ages. Um, Ruth is uh, saying in the chat, Robert Butler, the pioneer in aging research, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1976 for Why Survive, Growing Old in America. He was raised by his grandmother, too, and he was the first director of the National Institute of Aging. Thank you for that, Ruth. And, and it sounds like I've got to add something else to my reading list. I know you and John sent, sent me already something to, to read, but, but that sounds like it should uh, be on my reading list for, for this course, and it, it's not. Um, the next thing to notice is, is that um, culture matters for the repertoire of recognized scripts for enacting your personality, right? And so uh, what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to occupy a particular profession, a particular religious or ethnic identity? And obviously, we navigate all of those identities that are attributed to us, and, and many of them we come to identify with and, and then um, interpret from within. Some of them we may end up resisting or resenting and trying to reject altogether. But the idea that the culture provides the categories, the concepts, the expectations is also extremely important in thinking about the range of personality options. And in particular, in the context of what we're talking about here, the idea that cultures, different cultures, interpret aging in different ways, right? And, and so one of the things I learned in doing this research is that apparently Hindi, the, the most popular language in the Indian subcontinent, uh, it doesn't have a word for senility, right? And, and that in part reflects the fact that there's not a concept of generalized mental decline that comes with aging 
and therefore there's not an expectation. And so you might say that the, the repertoire, the script there is different um, from uh, what we see uh, in uh, other cultures, like in the United States. I'm getting another comment saying louder. I, I, I do apologize. I, I, I'm not sure why it should be different today, but I, I appreciate the reminder and I will speak up. Uh, third issue, malleability of personality across life. And, and, and here, the basic idea is that personality is not fixed. And that what psychology teaches us is that personality changes and evolves, and that in particular, there is such a thing as volitional personality change, meaning using your will, making a decision, deciding, I am experiencing difficulties in my life due to this aspect of myself. And maybe it's time I actually work on myself and try to change myself a little bit and see if I can't do better, right? And, and so all of that is in, in the background then as we get into what Levitin thinks contributes to successful aging. And, and, and here I'm gonna start with the interaction between the psychological and the neurological and how it is that um, the right kind of personality tends to age better. And, and so to begin with, we have five dimensions of personality variance. And, and um, Leventon points out that some of his mentors who worked in this field preferred a, a, a three dimension as opposed to a five dimension uh, typology of traits that some preferred other traits, but that in his view, these five have shown themselves to be uh, most capacious, most able to take into account the major dimensions of human personality development. And, and so um, the, let's, let's go through them for a moment. Extroversion. And, and I want to be as clear as possible. This is not your one of these types. All five of these types apply to you. And it's not meant to be normative or loaded per se. These are just meant to be descriptions. Finally, they're meant to refer to continue. And so when we come to extroversion, this has to do with the degree to which you are sociable, gregarious, um, someone who enjoys spending time in the company of others, and in particular is open to meeting new people, right? And, and, and this goes from a kind of continua in which there's just, you know, pure uh, solitude or withdrawal to uh, the kind of hyper social person who always wants to be needing, meeting new people. And, and one of the things that Leventon points out is that this varies with culture, right? Um, and um, the idea that, um, for instance, and, and, and I'll give you an example, I know that the, that the Finnish value solitude a lot. And so apparently, if you're on a walk in a forest in Finland, it's considered very bad manners to say anything to anybody else on the walk, right? You, you, you act as if you're the only person on the trail because you're there to, to be alone and commune with nature and being social interrupts that. Obviously, go to a national park in the United States, we have a different experience of being together with strangers in nature. Um, agreeableness, and, and, and this sounds uh, a little, um, loaded, but this, this is to do with how friendly, how um, tolerant, how likely you are to look for ways of resolving interpersonal conflicts, or on the other hand, 
how likely you are to say, I don't care. I'm going to be in conflict with that person. I know I'm right, or I want to do things my way, or I enjoy exercising power. And so it doesn't matter to me that they object or don't care. Right. So, so again, a continuum of different uh, places on an overall spectrum of possibilities from highly agreeable to highly disagreeable. Conscientiousness, and, and, and um, this refers to how um, diligent you are in managing your time, your activities, in adhering to social norms and expectations, in organizing your life. And, and I just want to note for a moment that one of the things that Leventon refers to, and, and, and I wish there were more evidence in the book. I, I did a little bit of searching and I, I couldn't find it readily that on many of these dimensions, we move from low to higher as we age. And that one of the really important dimensions is conscientiousness and, and that this has a neuroanatomical basis that, that this uh, um, capacity for executive decision making and self management and self control is located in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, at least that's its primary neuroanatomical location. And that's a portion of the brain that develops later in, into the late teens and early 20s. And so as we age, we get better at being conscientious. And based on what Levitin says, that doesn't just stop in your 20s. This continues throughout life. Um, emotional stability. And, and Levitin says, look, that you could also refer to this as sanity, right? That, 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 you know, are you basically somebody who is predictable in terms of their emotional reactions to situations? That doesn't mean that you're not necessarily highly emotional, but is your emotional range or repertoire stable? Or does it vary? Are you highly agreeable at one moment and highly disagreeable at another moment? And that um, depending upon whether you have a high level or a low level of emotional stability, you're likely to be categorized as being psychologically healthy or psychologically unhealthy. The final dimension here, and, and here you can see that there's a little bit more disagreement in how to categorize it, openness, intellect, imagination. And, and, and so openness refers to the willingness to try in and engage with new things. Will you go to a new restaurant or do you only like the cuisine you're familiar with? Do you welcome new people with new views and new cultural backgrounds into your social orbit? Or do you tend to primarily want to stay with people who are like you and you're already familiar with? And, and, and this could also be characterized in terms of intellect. How much do you like learning and especially learning new things? <clears throat> and then finally, imagination. Um, how able are you to imagine new things, to put yourself sympathetically in the position of someone that is quite different from you? Now, having said that, right, that there is this idea of age-related change and personality dimensions, and that on many of these scales, though not necessarily emotional stability, we tend to go higher as we age. And Leviton thinks that that is generally a positive thing, especially in terms of conscientiousness. We'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. But that if we're thinking about personality as one of the key things that determines how well we age, recognizing that personality is not fixed, that it changes over the lifespan, and that in many respects it changes in positive ways, is important to counteracting ageist stereotypes about age's decline. Um, 
volitional change in personality dimensions. And, and, and here again, the basic idea is that you are, we are human beings, reflective beings. We don't just habitually repeat previous behavioral patterns. We don't simply act on the basis of instinct. We have self-awareness, and that means we can evaluate how well our personality traits are working for us. Are we happy with what we have in life, how our lives are going, how our relationships, activities, and forms of vocation are rewarding us or not? And if we are not happy, can we trace the limits, the things that are hampering us back to dimensions of our personality? And if we can, we're not stuck. Um, and this then is the hard work, Levitin doesn't suggest it's easy, of changing or reforming your personality but he suggests that there's just a robust psychological literature that shows that this can be done and there's increasing uh, psychological advice on how to do it well um, and that this is important then in thinking about successful aging. I'll come back to the critical role of stress, but one of the things that Levinton emphasizes again and again is that stress is a um, neurologically mediated process. We, we, we stress refers to uh, glucocorticol production, including cortisol itself, and that these hormones produce neurochemical transmission and that they are good in the short term for putting us into the fight and flight mode when we are dealing with threats, but that long-term stress is debilitating. And actually, we see this at the neurological level. It, it, it uh, produces detriments in the hippocampus, which is a really important region of the brain for memory and thought. And so, one of the things to be thinking about is whether or not your personality is generating unnecessary or undue stress for you. I do see that the sun is shining in a peculiar way off a photograph behind me. I'm, I'm trying to, to shift my angle. I'm not doing very well, am I? That's better, isn't it? Um, sorry about that. And, and then and this is the, the, the critical advice that Levitin offers, is that we should cultivate four aspects of personality and psychology that he thinks contribute to well-being uh, at every stage of life, but in particular to maintaining well-being across a long lifespan. And so curiosity, which means being constantly engaged in learning new things. And he, he points out that this doesn't necessarily mean reading the hundredth book in the same field. It involves not only learning something a little bit different, but in an entirely different area. So if you're very accomplished in history, maybe it's time to learn to juggle or to do ballroom dancing, or to take up karate or a martial art, but, but, but keep your mind learning in radically new ways is a really good way to maintain neuroplasticity. Think of, of, of the brain, not just as an organ, but in a sense as a muscle and keep using it. Openness and, and closely related to curiosity, but this means don't simply stick to the things you know in your uh, mundane lived experience. Try new foods, travel to new places. If your 
a city person get out into nature. If you're somebody who loves being in nature, go to a museum, but, but, but keep yourself encountering new environments, new peoples, new cultures, new settings. And, and, and this is not just them learning new things, but having new experiences. Association, remain socially engaged, and in particular, try to meet new people and younger people. Um, conscientiousness, and, and, and this is right, an attribute that uh, he thinks grows with age and is very important for maintaining mental acuity and decreasing stress as aging. And in particular, he points out to begin with that there are some declines in short-term memory and uh, increased stress about declines in short-term memory that accompany aging. And that rather than simply pulling your hair out or being frustrated, do little things like always leave your keys or your phone or your wallet in one drawer or one place so that you just make a point of not putting it down wherever you happen to be, but saying, ah, wait, that's gonna cause me to lose it and be frustrated later, right? And, and, and maintaining your health. Recognize that, that you can remain physically robust late in life and then get your steps, go to your exercise class, do your rehabilitation or physical therapy or occupational therapy, right? Just be, recognize that what might have come easily, naturally, without much effort or organization early in life now requires conscientious self-application. And then finally, health, and, and, and this is not really a personality trait as he admits, but it completes the acronym of COACH. And, and, and his idea here is that you have to, in order to be able to maintain curiosity, openness, association, and conscientiousness, also maintain your health. And that that will require, as you get older, again, more deliberate efforts. All right, so next Thing. And, and, and this is where I think things start to get really interesting. Okay, give me one second, I'm gonna plug in. Because we started later, we're running a little bit longer today. I hope that's all right with you. Um, the um, ideas that I just shared with you under right personality, I think are, are things that are, are, are pretty generally known about aging well. What Levitin does with memory, I think is really quite fascinating. And, and, and I would point out Levitin is in certain respects reporting his own original research, but mainly synthesizing the research of other people. And so there've just been a lot of advances in memory uh, studies at the neuroscientific level over the last decade. And, and he's really, I think, very good at synthesizing all of this. And, and one of the things that he immediately points out is that memory is not a single thing, right? And in a sense, we're hampered by the fact that we have a single word and that we tend to experience the different neurocognitive dimensions of memory as being all the same thing, but that in fact, there are all multiple distinct neurocognitive systems evolved in memory, involved in memory, and, and that they have most likely evolved separately and distinctly from each other and evolved much earlier in the history of the species and in a much different and simple world, a world in which we didn't have phones, keys, and wallets, or <laughs> right big apartments with lots of rooms and spaces and nooks and crannies to lose things in, for instance. And, and so that this is one example of what uh, Daniel Dennett calls the, the uh, blind watchmaker, the, the, the fact that our brains evolved not 
as integrated units, but uh, to solve separate environmental and evolutionary problems. And then later we've tried to, or I shouldn't say we've tried to, it's not intentional, but we, we have integrated these different uh, independent systems and used them in ways that they probably were not evolved to do. So all of that to say, we should not be surprised that memory doesn't work the way we want it to work. And, and we'll get into this, but among the frustrating aspects of memory is it's not indexable, right? It's, it's not as if you can say cell phone location and, and then pull up all the different places that you've placed your cell phone in the last week, your memory instead is associative. And, and, and the result is that whatever happens to be associated with cell phone, maybe the call you got from your daughter last week comes to mind when you think of the cell phone, right? And, and so um, first, and, and, and this is why we start with memory when thinking about what happens in the brain with aging is because what Levitin calls drawing on the literature fundamental memory. And, and, and this is memory related to identity. Who am I? What makes me, me? And that is a kind of narrative accomplishment, right? We, 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 we select various aspects mm -hmm. of ourselves is the fact that I stubbed my toe badly in 11th grade while on a water skiing trip uh, essential to my sense of self? No, it's something that happened to me. I remember it because it hurt, but that doesn't really matter if I forget it. But the friends I made in graduate school, that's really important to me, to who I am, right? And, and, and so the role of memory in sustaining the sense of self and then the fear that it, it, if memory declines, so too does our identity, our capacity to remain who we are and what we think we are could also decline. And, and I want to point out immediately that what Levitin is suggesting is that although, yes, it's absolutely clear that memory is essential to maintaining sense of self, and although, yes, in a society like ours in which we have a stereotype that memory in general declines with age, we can understand why it is that many people are very anxious about the decline of memory as they age. This is actually for most of us not a threat. Depending upon which statistics you look at, between 10 and 15 percent of people over 80 suffer from some kind of dementia or generalized neurological decline. And while that is a large number, and that certainly is not something that we should take lightly, I want to be as clear as possible, you can look at this as glass half full as well, it means 85 to 90% of people over 80 do not suffer from any kind of general neurological decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. And, and just to be as clear as possible about that, I think that's very different from the stereotype of aging. And what Levitin shows is that actually what happens to memory with age is uneven. Some aspects of it do decline, but other aspects of it improve, and that it's entirely possible to compensate for some of the decline by developing the aspects that improve and using it and training it in the appropriate way. And, and so that then helps us to begin to unpack the different aspects of memory. And as you can see in this diagram, these diagrams, by the way, are not from Levitin's book. I, I went to some psychology sites to uh, try to give us a little bit more uh, of a 
visual representation of these ideas. Um, there's sensory memory. And, and, and so one way to think about this is how do you remember how to open a door handle? How do you remember how to use a fork and knife, right? You don't have to, each time you come to a door, study the handle, think about how to turn it, how to grip it, right? That's just kind of muscle memory or more accurately sensory memory. And we do this all the time, right? If you put a glass of water by the bedside table and you wake up in the middle of the night thirsty, do you have to turn on the lights or can you just kind of put your hand in the right place, find the glass of water, put it to your lips, put it back down? That's one aspect of memory. Then there is short-term memory. And, and this is, generally speaking, a very weak capacity. We, we have very limited short-term memory. It's why the development of writing has been so important to human intellectual progress. And, you know, the, there are obviously people with exceptionally good short-term memory. They're the kind of people who can do long division in their head, but the vast majority of us can't do that. And that doesn't mean that we're deficient. That just means that we're normal. And the thing about short-term memory is that because it has a very limited capacity, as soon as you start thinking about something else, you lose the capacity to remember the thing you were concentrating on but got distracted from. That's not a sign of aging. That's not a sign of being feeble in some way. This is simply the nature of human memory. We have to compensate for it, and we find ways of doing it, writing notes to self, doing things that are little memetic exercises to make sure that we remember, but we all have the experience, and we have it when we're 10 years old and in our 20s and in our 30s and 40s of right, starting in one room, going to the next room to get something, and by the time you get there, not knowing why you came to that room, right? And, and the issue is that something in the room you were in prompted you, oh, I need the scissors because there's a dead leaf on my plant and I want to cut it off, right? And then you get to the other room and you no longer have that cue, you no longer have that prompt. And a lot of our memory is situational and location specific. You come back to the first room, eventually you notice the plant and then you remember, oh, that's why I went there, right? The, the third kind of memory, long-term memory. And so this is not for something you're thinking about right now or just experience, but for things that you have uh, done a long time ago, do repeatedly, commit to memory, and then store there for a long time so that maybe eventually can dredge up again. And there are two kinds of uh, long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Implicit has to do with your capacity to do something that you have learned to do without thinking very much about it, right? And, and so a classic example of this is uh, playing a musical instrument, particularly learning once you've learned to play the musical instrument, a uh, complex piece of music, uh, you know, a, a long piano sonata, for instance. And, and, and so I don't do this, but I'm told that people who learn to play complex pieces of music, when they're playing it, they're not thinking this note, that note, this note, that note, despite the fact that the music is in front of them, they have learned to do it in a way that has allowed it to sink into their memory. It's why they have to practice and practice and practice in order to get a fair bit of it committed to implicit memory, memory where you don't really have to think about it while you're doing it. Explicit memory is much more uh, content. And, and, and so it, it has, as you can see, all of these different aspects to it. And I, I really want to focus on a few of them. Semantic memory. How you know that the capital of California is Sacramento, right? 
do you know it because at some point in your life you learned it and then you heard it again and again and it got reinforced and it's there it's it's part of your stock of referential knowledge about the world right and it turns out and and, and i want to be as clear as possible that the semantic memory gets stronger as you age there is an illusion that it gets weaker and that seems to be primarily dictated by the fact that there's so much more of it and because memory is associative it sometimes is harder to pull up what it is you're thinking about at the moment what is the capital of california again but having said that you're actually better at learning new information about the world when you're older than when you're younger. Episodic memory refers to remembering things that are critical about yourself and your life. And here, I, I want to dwell for a moment on, the, on a, the, the idea that neither perception nor memory are reliable reproductions of the external world. And, and I think we have this illusion. Um, it's probably a functional uh, illusion in, in terms of evolution, which is why we still have it, that on the one hand, what we see is what the world is. And, and there's just lots of evidence that, that we make all kinds of corrections and revisions and emendations to the sensory input at the moment that we're getting it, right? That, we see things that aren't there, that we fill in blind spots, that we uh, fill in the uh, auditory equivalent of the blind spot, a loud noise goes off and you literally can't hear what somebody says, but you think you've heard the full thing because your brain actively generates a theory. Oh, it must have been that word. That's the only word that makes sense in the context. And that just as the brain is actually very active in constructing our perception of the world, it's very active in reconstructing our memory of the world. And so again, it fills in blanks, it um, embellishes, it rounds out, it also edits and gets rid of extraneous stuff. And, and so there's very good evidence that each time you replay a memory, you, you bring it into your explicit consciousness, it is typically slightly different than the previous time you remember. And, and so remembering, literally putting back together the pieces is an active, creative, but unconscious process of editing and reconstructing the memory of the world, including the memory of yourself and the experiences that you've had. Autobiographical memory, I'll be very quick, but this is what we do with episodic memory. I'm going to remember that episode where I stubbed my toe, not because it's important to who I am, but because it hurt. On the other hand, I'm going to remember those friends because they were instrumental in my process of becoming who I am became who I am in relation to them, in dialogue with them, learning from them, learning about myself from them. And so that's going to become part of my autobiographical memory. I think that's perhaps a, a, a good place to, to leave off for today in terms of what I have to say to you and to, to open discussion. But the critical takeaway point to this, and, and, and uh, one of the things to see, they're different regions of the brain involved in laying down and organizing memory, right? And, and, and so what is memory? Memory is ultimately, uh, at least in Levitin's theory, uh, a pathway of neural transmission in the brain between the neurons, right? And, and the question is, how does that pathway get organized? And then how does it get reactivated? The, the second is the question not of the construction of memory, but the recall, right? Those are two distinct processes, different regions of the brain active in each of them. But 
It is also the case that it's extremely important to recognize that as we get older, certain things get less powerful, less good episodic memory, some aspects of autobiographical memory, some aspects of implicit memory get weaker. Other things like sensory memory um, are, it appears, every bit as strong late in life as they were earlier in life. And this includes aspects of explicit memory, including semantic memory. And so recognizing that, that, that what happens as we age is that certain things become harder, certain things like pattern recognition and extraction, which is critical to memory, actually get stronger. And, and so cultures that refer to the elderly as wise and sagacious and turn to them for advice probably place more value on those aspects of memory that are stronger. Cultures that view the old as enfeebled or in some sense deficient maybe put more emphasis on other aspects of memory. We're going to get into this a little bit later next week, but similar things, it turns out, are true with intelligence. Intelligence is not one thing, but many different things, or to put it differently, there are multiple intelligences. And um, as we age, some of our intelligences get stronger, and some of them uh, not as strong. Um, Boy, Bonnie, I, I think I got to ask, what am I seeing behind you, Bonnie, Bonnie McKenzie? I, I see, what, what was that? Is that a cat? Yes. Now, now I can see. I, w I was seeing it from a funny angle. I was, what is oh, that yeah. creature? Yes. All right, okay. everybody. I'll leave off there. Any, what questions, thoughts, comments do you have? Who wants to start us off? You'll have to unmute yourselves as you know. Barbara, are you are you getting ready to say something? Uh, thank you for saying hello, uh, David. Uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, COVID is not a, a small matter for us here at uh, Apartment 401. We're, David and I have both pretty, been pretty sick. Okay. But we're both almost okay. well, almost well. Sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. We have, yeah. we have yeah. had a very big outbreak here. Suddenly from one case among staff and uh, residents together to something like 30 people were ill within less than a week. Yeah. Yeah. David wants to say something. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add a piece about how <laughs> about um, the um, uh, memory, uh, particularly um, uh, long-term memory. The, the, the important thing I think to remember about long-term memory is that this is where what we call knowledge goes. And, um, and uh, the other thing about long-term memory is that it, it does continue to grow. We learn th new things all the time. And as we learn them, they make their way into that long-term memory. The other thing I wanted to say is that uh, episodic memory and semantic memory work hand in glove so that if you have a concept of a chair, it entails the fact that it's got four legs, you can sit in it, and you know, if you have enough of them, you can gather with other people uh, to talk and converse and do things. But your memory for chair is also um, sort of colored by your memory of that chair that your mother or grandmother or maybe grandfather used to read to you in. So that when you think of chair, you can't help but think of those trace, those episodic traces that make chair a unique experience for you. So those two things work together. You know it's functional, that it's like all other chairs in the world, but it's also very special for you. Great, thank, thank you for Great. it. Um, and I did uh, mute you just because we were getting some echo and feedback, but feel free to unmute if, if you wanna to respond to this. And uh, one of the things I learned from Leviton and, and I've, I've been, reading some uh, cognitive science and philosophy of mind recently uh, as well, and it emphasizes this as well, is, is that um, this capacity for conceptual abstraction, 
So, so what David just said, we, we, we take absolutely for granted. By the way, I'm sitting on a chair right now that has five legs with wheels on all of them, right? But that doesn't make it any less a chair than that thing with four legs that just have feet as opposed to wheels, right? Why? Well, because it serves the same function. It's something that stably supports me while I sit so that I'm not having to stand or falling over or having to slump on the floor, right? And, and, and that, yes, having this kind of chair is good for reading, but maybe less good for dining. I'm not positive about that, but, but that's at least our custom in this culture. And um, that this capacity to, to see these very different things, right? Is a throne a chair? Is a bar stool a chair? Is a seat in a car maybe very much like a chair? That, that this capacity to, to recognize by abstracting from the specific and then using a general unifying concept to organize our world is absolutely critical to human intelligence and our ability to do it is probably why we were able to make the leap to language right and, and and how essential language is to organizing our thought right try to have an experience outside of language I, i'm convinced that it's possible but i'm also convinced that the moment that you try to think about it you've got to pull it back into language right that, that language mediates our entire experience of the world makes us who we are depends on our capacity for conceptual abstraction and organization memory is very important in doing this and that this capacity remains very strong for the vast majority of us all the way into our 80s and 90s and in certain respects gets stronger the, the, the capacity for pattern recognition there's really good lab-based cognitive science research that shows the older you get the better you get at doing it and that there are reasons, the, the way in which it's rooted in the architecture of the brain and the way in which as you use those neural pathways more and more, they get stronger and uh, more um, developed over time, that, that this makes us actually better in certain respects at remembering, at thinking at learning as we get older. And so it turns out our culture, our stereotypes are just really not very adequate to understanding what our neuroscience and psychology are teaching us. Thank you for that, David. And, and, and I, I should be careful here. I imagine you know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, so feel free to keep supplementing or correcting as necessary. Anybody else with, with, with thoughts on this for today? Well, I know it's late. I know you guys have, have lunches to get to and that we started late and ran late. I will say so long. I hope that you get the virus back under control and that those of you who are currently having to stay in your apartments are able to be out by the time I see you next week. Take care of yourselves. Good being with you. I'll see you next week to continue the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.